Hello and welcome back to my channel and Crystal One on One. We are at the Patio Restaurant and Lounge, a lovely spot in Bokoto. And today I'm so excited because I'm catching up with someone that I've known for ages. He was, is, is a media personality, he's a psychotherapist and the CEO of Child's Eye Foundation. I have Chris Mugalu joining me today. Hello. Hey. How are you? I'm all good. Thanks. We've already hugged and all of that. <laughs> we have. We have. <laughs> so nice to see you same here we tried to catch up but mm -hmm. not just quite you're a busy man <laughs> there was a point when i was like you're in the country oh no you're not you're in the country oh i just missed him yeah it's so, confusing so work is in the uk and uganda for you mostly yeah so that's a good question it's mm -hmm. interesting so my work is actually uganda mm -hmm. but i'm based in the united kingdom okay for global advocacy purpose and fundraising okay i would love to change that though okay <laughs> you're looking at coming back home eventually absolutely well you are ugandan i am did you grow up here or mm -hmm, let's I go did. back to that <laughs> i did i did I, I i considered most of my kind of uh growing up phase being in Uganda, mm -hmm. but I have influence from across the world, the US, the UK, and mm -hmm. that's my accent. Mm -hmm. I've also gone to a lot of different schools, uh, but I grew up here, you know, and this country has given me the best perspective of becoming a young adult and the adult that I am now. In what way? <laughs> well, my friends are here, you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I had my first job here, my first business at 16, uh, which mm -hmm. is a flower company. <laughs> um, uh, my, my radio gig with you, uh, mm -hmm. at Sanyu. We um, did the breakfast show together. That's right. Mm -hmm. I also went to university here. You know, people forget that. My first degree was in Uganda, mm -hmm. mass communication. And yes. um, I think I'm the person I am because of all that. Okay. Um, so I, I celebrate Uganda and I also feel that, you know, my, my parents, my family all come from this country. Mm -hmm. I devoted my time to investing my life in doing better for our country. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know you've done so many different things, but as Child's Eye, maybe you can just tell us about your work there. You're doing some important work <laughs> with Child's Eye Foundation. No, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for getting it right, because people call us Eye Child. Oh. oh all sorts of things, yeah. But it's, it's a complex name, but Child's Eye Foundation mm -hmm. is uh, a social impact organization. Mm -hmm. We prefer to call ourselves social impact, and I'll explain that, mm -hmm. not charity. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, let me explain that, because charity is what we do for each other, and they often say charity starts at home. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it doesn't take a foreign organization or a external organization to come and do charity. Actually, when you support your people, which a lot of Ugandans do, whether it's helping them to organize a wedding, whether it's a funeral, that is what we call charity. Or oh, helping pay school fees. Yes. Or, mm -hmm. But us guys are social impact. We come in and what the country, the people we're supporting, our people who invest in our work want to see is real impact. Oh. They don't want to see charity. Mm -hmm. So, Child's Eye Foundation is a social impact organization. We are demonstrating alternatives. So we're showing that children can grow up in families and not orphanages. Um, sometimes a difficult concept for people to understand. Mm. Um, Why? And I can understand that. Why? Well, I... Because some people would say, but I mean, for so many people, orphanages gave them the break they needed in life or, yeah. you know, were able to give them a chance in life. I mean, so why? Why the shift? No, that's, that's a good point. Um, look, I, 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 I volunteered at Sanyu. Mm -hmm. I've even donated to an orphanage. Mm -hmm. Child's so Sanyu Baby's Home. Sanyu Baby's Home. <laughs> Um, Child's Eye Foundation started out as an orphanage as well. We were called Malaika Baby's Home in Rubaga. Ah. And so our story, to answer your question, is a story of experience and change. Uh, we used to take in abandoned babies and we found that 95% and sometimes 98% of those children could go back to a family, a biological family, an extended family, even kin. So kin could be a godparent, an extended uncle and auntie in the community. Mm -hmm. They did not need to be in the orphanage. So they had family? They had family. Research tells us 80 to 90% of children that grow up in orphanages across the world have family. The reason we talk about demonstrating that alternative is because from inception, we first of all understood that children could go back. Ugandan social workers told our founder look, we can do this differently. She listened. And that's the point that I come in and, and work with her to transition our model mm -hmm. into a community-based model. Okay. So we started off as a 25-bed home. 
we reduced it to an eight bed home. Mm -hmm. And catch this, we realized that even if there was one child or eight children in the house, it cost almost the same because you still have to pay salaries. Mm -hmm. So when you have no children in the orphanage, you still have to pay. So we found that we were driving to get children in so that we were relevant, mm. so that our costs made sense. So it became a business model for okay. us. Now, I'm speaking about what we went through. Wow. And I hope, I'm hopefully telling you what other orphanages will go through. Mm -hmm. It becomes a business model, a sustainability model. We need more children. So we go out looking for children. Now, in many situations, we recruit the children. Okay. Because the reason, or one of the primary reasons children are growing up in orphanages is poverty. Yes. Mm -hmm. So parents can't access medical care. They can't access education. Um, yes, a parent could have died or parents could have died, but there's a real sense of we can't look after these children. Yes, yes. Sometimes they're abandoned or just rejected because they're like, we already have enough on our plate. Yes. We can't deal with... Yes. Mm -hmm. A child with disabilities, in some contexts and cultures, a girl. Mm. Now, my question is, should we allow that or should we change the mindset? Do you think for some uh, orphanages, it was difficult because there's a lot of work that goes into tracing the family. And then, of course, you have to convince the family and then support the family, right? Absolutely. For that kind of relocation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I have I've had family drama. <laughs> we had to get through it, right? Okay. Um, do you remember the first day you held your child in your hand? Mm -hmm. So do I. Very clearly. All of them. Mm -hmm. And there was an anxiety for me of what I was going to do, whether to raise them, to provide for them, mm. to be the father I needed to be. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Those all those things. Um, I, I, getting married at 25, you know, I had my first child eight years later, and I still felt that I was 25. I'm not, I'm not old enough. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, this is not happening. You know, was, like I'm not ready. Yes, I'm not ready. There was a real excitement, but mm. there was also a real anxiety. Mm. My mother, my friends, my sisters, my brothers, my uncles, my aunties, those are the people mm -hmm. who really kind of shaped this parenting journey for me. Mm. Now, let me, let me remove it from myself and go You're back to... You're saying you did not grow up with a father. Well, I, no. But the point I'm also making is, even for these families, there is a real anxiety. By the way, I've never met a parent who didn't want, this is my experience, a good thing for their child. Um, I often say to the social workers that I've worked with, I've trained, the doctors, that most parents, in fact, in my scenario, all parents that I've worked with want the best for their children. It's just that along their journey, things happen, life happens. And then they need services, people, community, friends, books, magazines, experiences, stories, to help them really understand what they're going through. I've worked with children whose parents were serious alcoholics. I've worked with children whose parents are in prison. You know, I've worked with young mothers, teenage mothers, who mm. never expected to become a mother as young as 16. Yeah. Life happened. And they could have chosen to abandon those children, but they then have the support services like ours to come and encourage and keep them on that journey. Mm -hmm. To connect with their mother or their grandparents, to help them raise that child with their uncles and aunties, so that they can form a new story for that child. I like what you said, life happens, and that's the reality. It is. Because it's also when you get older and become a parent that you begin to look at your parents and you realize they're just human beings. They made mistakes. They were trying to figure it out because you're doing the exact same thing. You're just Absolutely. trying to figure it out Absolutely. with what you have. Absolutely. Hmm. I, I often say to my wife, Travel, that, um, you know, people, people will say, oh, Americans are always going through therapy. Or they'll say, why do people go to therapy? We all have a trauma. Mm -hmm. A level Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. <laughs> that we need to talk about, experience, share. And, and understand ourselves and better. And understand ourselves better. And you know, the point you make about becoming a parent is so important. Mm. So kind of going back to the story about our work, we want parents who have been told you can't look after a child to realize that that's not their story. Mm. We want them to realize that with support, their yeah. story can change. Mm. And, and I'll, leave, I'll leave this with you as well, because this is the most significant part of the work. And I'll also tell you a bit of a quick story. We don't do this work to continue doing it. We don't 
become supporters of the communities we work with so that we're here forever. Mm -hmm. In fact, we want to do ourselves out of a job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, so you want to give them the support they need so they can be independent and move forward on their own? 100%. Mm -hmm. We want to come into communities and do one, prevent separation of children from their families. So strengthen families and ensure that they're able to cope with the shocks, COVID-19, HIV, income issues, rising fuel costs, so that we can support them. We want them then to build a community around themselves. So we take their lived experience stories and ask them to share it with other parents. And they become community champions and community volunteers. So that when parent X says, oh, I'm going through this situation, they go, oh, there's a lady here mm -hmm. who had the same experience as a guy here. So that's number one, prevention. The second thing is we want to create alternatives. Now, people use the word foster care. I don't quite like that word because mm. it's a Western word. We, we never had this word in our, our country. In fact, what, what would we call it? It's alternative families okay. in English, mm -hmm. but in my language, Luganda, I can tell you, it's, it's got its own concept. Um, but even the word orphanage doesn't mm -hmm. exist in my language mm -hmm. and in many Ugandan languages. Yeah. So we create alternative families. Those are the families that will be there if a child can't go back. Because in reality, there's some children who can't go back home. We don't trace their families. Um, the parents might not be ready. Mm -hmm. um, we've worked you realize it's not a safe environment. environment for that child. So the alternative family, and I brought something with me today called the Ugandan Foster Care Guidelines because a lot of people don't even know that this stuff exists. Mm -hmm. Uganda has guidelines yes. for us to identify, train, and assess and government approve individuals who can provide alternative safe settings for children. A lot of people don't know this, that no. you can actually foster yes. children. Yes. It doesn't matter where you are and what community you're in. Absolutely. Mm. So emergency foster for a short period if a child is abandoned, as mm. we trace, or long-term fostering where we know the family and maybe there is issues of alcoholism, violence and other things, but we still want contact. Mm. You know, I, Crystal, I think I used to tell you this. Children come to terms with the parents they have. So a man who was a drug dealer, a man, who was even violent, a boy, can grow up idolizing that, that father. Do you realize that? Yeah, <laughs> it happens. So we have to make sure that that connection isn't necessarily broken, but understood. Mm. Because we don't want the gap to be there. I keep saying to people. Yeah, because children need to know where they come from. Exactly. Sense There's of belonging no, yes. will, will haunt you all your life. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as an absent father. Mm -hmm. Absent fathers don't live on the moon. <laughs> they exist in a child's mind. The child is thinking, hmm, if that guy had a father, then I must have had one. What's mine? And then they start to form it. You know? So in my work, actually, in my psychotherapy work in the UK, a lot of the boys I worked with often thought their fathers were the biggest drug lords on the street. They idealized that and they so wanted they to become that. So they created some kind of image in their you mind. See? But the same thing happens here. Or some people think my parents were losers, and therefore I'm going to be a... So we, we need to make sure that connection isn't savored, but understood for mm. the child. Mm -hmm. So in long-term foster care, that relationship with child and parent sometimes continues, but we raise them till they're 18 and they will move on and make their own decisions, what kind of relationship they have with their family, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Those long-term foster carers and emergency foster carers, Ugandan, amazing. We celebrate them and I want to say to you, if you can, give shouts, recognize, get people to really celebrate our Ugandan alternative families. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, so remember the first is prevention, mm -hmm. then alternative families. Yes. The last aspect is repurposing orphanages. You know, I developed a bit of a reputation, huh? Mm -hmm. uh oh So here comes this guy who wants to close our orphanages. Oh, that's what people <laughs> thought. But like this guy. <laughs> and his organization. If you take away our children, then, then yes. what happens to us? And there's a real debate. There's a real debate with a lot of organizations going, but is it the right thing to do? Mm. Well, it is. And for me, it's based on evidence, evidence of practice, evidence of what we've seen, years of evidence from attachment theory to whatever we know about parenting children today, you know? Mm. So we want to repurpose the orphanages, not close them. Repurpose. Yes. So you come to an orphanage, it has 60 children, sometimes 100, sometimes more. The work we do is to educate them on, around child protection and safeguarding, but also on issues of attachment and parenting for those children. 
So once they have that knowledge, they understand the impact that growing up in institutional care has on a child. Uh -huh. You have no sense of belonging. Research tells us that most of those children leave the orphanage with very little social skills and mm -hmm. life skills. Mm -hmm. So they go on to become pregnant. Mental health is a serious issue. So suicidal ideation, wanting to take their own lives, criminality. How many people do you know who have told you, I grew up in an orphanage? You know, it's not common. Mm. So is there a shame for that story? What's happening? So we've got to realize that there might be help, but it's not necessarily the help that those children need. Mm. So in repurposing, we want to change the way we care. Okay. Re-inspire them to do it differently. So instead of six to a hundred in an institution, we want them to support those families in their community. In the communities, in families? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. In Toro District, there were five orphanages. We got there in 2017. By 2020, 2018, the local government, in partnership with us and other CSOs, civil society organizations, had agreed that there'll be a moratorium that no child will enter an orphanage so that we could start the transitioning process. Okay. By March 2020, we were transitioning the last baby's home or the last orphanage. In three years? Yes. Today, as I speak to you, there is no child in an orphanage in Toro. These orphanages that we supported, two that we supported to repurpose, the others changed the model on their own from watching the others. Mm. But the two that we supported to transition have become community services. They will be able to support a thousand, not 60, not a hundred, a thousand households. Mm -hmm. We saw this in COVID. So one of our partner organizations, because we don't just say often, if they're a partner organization now, mm -hmm. supported children and families experiencing adverse experiences and shocks from COVID because they could go to those families, they could deliver food. So they were part of the government response in Toro District for women who were experiencing violence, for babies and children, for men who were struggling with employment, so on and so forth. So they were able to, to help way more people, way more children, but not just the children, the families and the communities that the children are in. That's right. Okay, Chris, I, right. I need to take you back. That's um, right. Your background in media. You said even now, you still, yeah, <laughs> dabble. I, I don't know. Some people have seen you in BBC. They're like, hey, what's that? what is Chris talking about? That's there's, right. there's so much work that you've been doing. But you grew up in Uganda and your first business was at 16. Yes. Why did you feel you had to go into business at that age? How did it happen? So my dad was... Mm -hmm a serious businessman and you remember what I told you about shaping the story for your children mm. everybody told me hey your father you know hey. he was a businessman you know he started like this you know he did this so I had this I won't say it was a pressure but I had this kind of nudge this thing in me mm -hmm. that a gentle nudge going you've got to do this you've got to create your story you've got to create a story like your father's you've got so to you be felt like the pressure man. you've got mm -hmm. to exactly so you know I started hustling as we say you know walking our streets mm -hmm. um, but I was able to, you know, partner with a friend and uh, his father had a flower uh, farm and we used a flower to... Flower farm? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We used to do a deal and uh, take some of those flowers. Uh -huh. If he's watching this, he'll know who he is. <laughs> and um, yeah, we, 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 we delivered flowers for Valentine's. Our biggest time was Valentine's. So at that point, I mean, this is way <laughs> back. We didn't have social media. No. How did, how did people find out about it? What, what networks did you use back then? Was it school? No, no. Well, part of it was school, but you know what's interesting? We, we always say we didn't have social media, but we had social media. Mm. We had social connection. Word of mouth was amazing. You know, mm -hmm. it's the same way we say, um, I was never late for an appointment when there were no mobile phones, but I was there. We'd make that call and you'd be there. Yes. It worked. <laughs> so there was a way we could get word of mouth out. Do you know Chris? Do you know this guy? Do you know this person? Mm -hmm. They're doing this. Call them. Go and see them. So of course, 04128, whatever the number was, was there. Mm -hmm. Call. Can you deliver to this place? And we found those places by the mango tree, near the <laughs> anthill, down the road, go the battery, deliver the flowers. <laughs> we did it. Uh -huh. So that was my first business. Um, How long was that? Like, I think I think we did that for a year. Mm -hmm. And the person and then ah, oh, young business people, you know, we we get excited. The money made a little bit of money. Oh man, cheddar, you know. <laughs> And, and I have to give some props to, you know, the Auntie Grace in Babali, who, who actually really got me into this, because mm -hmm. she's the one who taught me how to cut flowers. And then I, I actually left and went and thought I could start my own business. Mm. Um, so I did that for a year, and then obviously I had to go back to school. Then I worked on Straight Talk Foundation. Mm -hmm. I was the 
radio producer and presenter of Straight Talk, and I love that. You mm -hmm. know, that actually gave me my new identity. And it was a foundation for meaningful conversation as well. Absolutely. I mean, we were, look. In many ways, I think it's also pushed you into where you are now, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And traveling Uganda with Straight Talk really taught me about our country. Mm. It taught me how to love Uganda. You know, I've seen what people have experienced in the lockdown with, you know, kind of traveling the country. I appreciate it when people do that. Mm. Man, we went to Moroto, huh? Karamoja, places that people had never gone to. We went to Sese, we went to Guru, we went to Lira, we went to Bale. Loved it. And this was Ajumani. like when you were about like, what, 18, 19? I was 18, 19, exactly. In fact, I was in northern Uganda when Ebola first broke out, doing the whole straight talk thing in refugee camps, supporting young people to understand the importance of you know, making good decisions, relationship decisions, and sexual health decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that, that media part of my story was amazing. And then, you know, once, once I did that, I don't know if you remember, I got a bit frustrated with doing that part of radio. I wanted to do commercial radio. I wanted to be a voice on radio. And mm -hmm. I, I met you and you became my mentor. Um, and they first put me on the night shift, you remember? Yes. Um, which was hard. We uh, all had to uh, go oh through man. it. <laughs> you, you told me. Remember you kept saying to me, no, late hours. Listen, listen, Chris, we all do it. And then I, I did a bit of the hot mix. Um, and then we were paired. Mm -hmm. um, thanks to many amazing people. And I think that really changed my life. Mm -hmm. We had meaningful conversations even then. We really did. You know, so. But also you were trying, <laughs> much as you wanted to do commercial radio, <laughs> you're also trying to find your fit. Overstructuring it. And, <laughs> no, I was. I mm. was. Um, look, I, I, I trained as a, a journalist, a mass communication ex exper expert or whatever. But um, really the call for me was to become a psychotherapist. Uh, to be a social healer, uh, a community helper, a so You did not know that then? I did not. Mm -hmm. um, I did not, but you know, a lot of my conversations with people were about how can I help. I, I was trying to help people, I was trying to do stuff, I was trying to be a supporter and I was doing it without a template. So I was doing it <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Let me help you. Yes, and you got your burnt friend. so many oh, times. Oh man, burnt so well, you remember, mm -hmm. you remember. So. Um, Having gone through my own therapy journey and, and learning how to become a psychotherapist really taught me how to listen, uh, how to carry my own baggage, how mm. to put it down before I help pick up other people's baggage with them, how to take them to where I can take them to. Um, so I've still used some of that in, in mass communication, in media. Um, I worked with uh, an organization called dad.info, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, part of an institute called the Family Matters Institute, where we launched a website for fathers, actually the largest website in Europe for dads. And the reason we did that is we found that there was a lot of information for mothers. And this oh, wasn't, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's too uh, much sometimes. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. this wasn't about saying, let's, it's not a competition. It was about leveraging information for men versus information for women. Mm. It was about giving information to men so that we could support women. Mm. It was about enabling fathers to walk the journey with their partners, whether they were together or not. I have a child with you, this is our journey. Mm -hmm. There's a real commitment. We made this child together. Mm -hmm. We better walk this journey together. And I have together. to be there for this child. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? Setting the template for your children. So we created this site. You would never believe it. Um, we had 700 unique users. So these are the number of unique people who mm -hmm. access the site uh, a month. and. By the time I was leaving, we were at 70,000 unique users. When did you set up that site? So this was 2015-16. Uh -huh. uh, and that, no, actually way before that. So 20, 2013 maybe, three years I worked with those guys. Uh, phenomenal work, amazing team. We got some support from the National Geographic Junior mm -hmm. to help us build the content okay. um, so we could engage men. But the significant thing for me was we had men who came online because we had a forum. Again, suicidal ideation was a big one, mm -hmm. believe it or not. I so think we that's were, when you started going down the direction of conversation around I, mental health for young absolutely, men. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that, that really woke me up. I was like, and, and some of these guys were young. They were like 23. Mm -hmm. So they'd had three children by that time. They're struggling. You know, no one understands me. But they had a story of their own. Mm -hmm. um, then we had a lot of mothers and parents of boys referring them to the site. So we also had to build content for them. 
So in terms of media, I mean, that was all my training. Mm -hmm. I had to create this site, work with a media team, give content, create content that mattered to men. So we had sports content. I'm not, I'm not a big believer that all men love sports. So I don't, you know, so we had to really mm -hmm. diversify that content. Yes. Um, some men like fashion. A lot of men like fashion. Um, so we had to build the content in different ways. We, we even dropped a push chair off a, a building. Yeah, I'm very embarrassed. Very, very embarrassed. But, but it got us views. Okay. <laughs> it worked. I'm sure it was fun. <laughs> it's okay, you can admit it. It must have been fun. <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, but it was exciting. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So that was a good experience. And as I said, wow. I worked with a good team. But that, as you say, drove me closer. I kept thinking, how do I do more around well-being and, and awareness and life skills? Because, you know, mental health is life skills. Mm -hmm. Coping with coping. money, coping mm -hmm. with relationships, people, the heat. Whatever it is, whatever challenges Absolutely. life throws at you. Absolutely. <laughs> you need to be able to cope. That's it. Life and social skills. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I often like to tell people that, look, we're going we're gonna to talk about mental health because that's what the word is. But really what we're talking about is life and social skills. And social skills. Yeah. So leaving Uganda... Um, how did you leave Uganda? Did you have something already set up for you? <laughs> I mean, for many people it's like, I left, then you don't really know what's going on for like two years and then, oh, this is what I'm doing now. <laughs> so, so my leaving Uganda story is interesting. I left Uganda because of a, an amazing woman. Mm -hmm. I had, I'd started a relationship. We committed that we had to live together. So we dated for a year, apart, uh, hot male. And uh, <laughs> what was that? M MSN chat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, MSN chat. Dial up. So, uh -huh. so this is not going to work. We tried the long distance. Mm -mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I moved essentially to be with her. To be with her. And um, I applied for a master's program and I didn't get the first one. And then I applied for a second and that was in multimedia production. So I went to University of London uh, and the School of Audio Engineering. And that was really an eye-opener for me. Um, mm -hmm. I thought I'd be a creative engineer, but I didn't want to be a creative engineer. Um, and then I volunteered, mm -hmm. I interned rather, just a paid internship at the BBC mm -hmm. uh, with Ben Dotse uh, and Paul Bachibinga. Uh, Paul and Ben were inspirational to me. I feel that would have been a journey I'd have continued, mm -hmm. but I experienced some racism. You know, I was told to work in the, and a lot of people will say this is how it starts, but uh, reflection has taught me different. So I was asked to work in the archives, and with every Ugandan story, Idi Amin died, do this. Mm. You know, there were so many other bigger stories. There were so many other things I could write on. I was a writer I could never give in those, you know. Uh, and I, I just felt that, you know. So they kind of put you in a box yeah. of, of who Africa, what, you know, what yeah. stories are good from Uganda. Absolutely. Mm. That wasn't me. Um, you know, Crystal, you knew me. I, I you know, I was, I was large. We were larger than life. Remember that <laughs> on the breakfast show? Yeah. Larger than life. You know, we, we wanted more. And I, I did. So I went to work for a community organization called The African Child. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was supporting children and young people transitioning into the UK system. Having come to the UK as refugees uh, from Somalia, from Ethiopia. Um, wow. and lots of other countries mm -hmm. and uh, the program had a major aspect around HIV so my straight talk background supported that mm -hmm. uh, family support economic strengthening for those families getting them into employment ensuring their kids were registered in school housing mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'd spend days and nights uh, supporting you know girls as young as 16 Muslim uh, Somali girls as young as 16 to find housing um, I would be at the housing office uh, on a Friday at 9, waiting, you know, saying, no, we have nowhere to put them. Uh, in the UK, we had this temporary housing. It was horrible, you know, it was unsafe. Uh, many people might think it's all great, but it isn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were unsafe. We had to double lock their doors or bring a person, a locksmith, to add another lock so that they were safe. Mm -hmm. um, they were not trusting. I was a man, you know, so uh -huh. it was a challenge to build those relationships. but. That taught me a lot about learning to build relationships. So the African Child shaped that journey for me. I went to work for uh, Quorum. Quorum is actually the organization that really kind of opened my mind into 
families. And um, Coram gave me my uh, opportunity to go to the Tavistock. Tavistock is a very prestigious educational institution uh, for therapy and psychotherapy. You know, you, you queue up for it. And I was very, 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 very blessed to go there. Okay. I met the greatest minds. But the thing I introduced was the feminist approach to masculinity. The feminist <laughs> approach to masculinity. Boom. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Now, now I know I'm going to get into trouble for this, mm. but this is my opportunity to get it out there. <laughs> so, look, um, I don't believe the word man is bad. Or masculinity. Or masculine. Or masculinity. And I also, I kind of, I worry when we use toxic masculinity. That's, I think that's the only time you hear about masculinity. Exactly. It's like it has to be toxic, exactly. which is not true at all. Exactly. But the reason we have the word toxic masculinity is because of the relationship masculinity has with femininity or with women. Hmm. Um, so toxic masculinity in the way we know it is men behaving badly. But they're not just behaving badly to each other, they're behaving badly towards women. Mm -hmm. So the feminist approach to masculinity is ensuring that we reclaim masculinity for what it is not positive masculinity not good masculinity masculinity for what it is mm -hmm. and I want to push the word feminist approach away but I really want to raise my son to work with men and to live with male friends who know that it is important to realize that we have a sudden privilege that we need to do away with that affects women that's the feminist approach to masculinity. Okay. We need to make sure that when we walk into places, sometimes people will say, oh, the man is going to pay the bill. The man is driving the car. The man is the, you know what I mean? All that. The privilege. man is in control. Yes. When they see a woman with a child on her own, she has no man. <laughs> she can't manage. Mm. But you, why don't you get married? Why don't you have a good life? Go find a man. You know, all those things. So I, I'd like to change that status quo for my children, for the men I know, for my friends. Um, so, putting feminist approach to masculinity away, masculinity in its own, it's a positive word. That's what I want to change. Yes. Um, I've been I have been talking about that a lot, also because I have a son. Yeah. I'm like, we cannot be the same. We simply cannot be the same. We both have Absolutely our strengths enough. and our positive, that come with gender. Oh, let's not go there. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's another conversation. That's, a, that's another day. We'll mm -hmm. be back. But there's so many beautiful things about masculinity. Uh, mm -hmm. There are. There mm -hmm. are. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I also don't shy away from being strong. But strong shouldn't mean violent. Mm -hmm. I don't shy away from being hardworking. But hardworking shouldn't mean no time with your children, no time with your partner, no time for your family or your friends. Mm -hmm. um, and the list could go on. I don't want to go on about this. But... The one other thing that I have done in that space is also worked with an organization called Future Men. Uh, it used to be called Working With Men. Mm. And when I joined it, we wanted to rebrand. And that's actually the reason I was brought on. And completely rebranded that with the help of the staff and the community that we supported, the boys and young men, fathers and their mothers. And the reason we called it Future Men is we wanted to aspire to create a boy, a young adult and a man that could be a better version of themselves throughout that period, not just for their well-being and their health, but for those around them, including women. Is this when you started on the Boys to Men program campaign? So Boys to Men actually starts earlier on in my life. But okay. uh, when I come to child, We're not I, talking about the, the, <laughs> no, the, the, no, the group. No, not the group. <laughs> not the group. Mm -hmm. So it starts earlier on in my life with Coram. Okay. And then, I do quorum, I become a trainer of trainers, I work with the UK government and policy institutions to reshape um, policy around children and families in the UK, including, and I'm proud to say, um, um, shared parental leave. So shared parental leave is where, this is going to shock you, mm -hmm. is where mom and dad can have shared leave. Mm -hmm. So you know, usually it's mothers that have Mm -hmm. Maternity leave? Yes. There's paternity leave? Yes. Shared parental leave allows you to share that time. So in the UK, you can be on leave for up to nine months and uh, you can share that. You can do it in blocks of three each, three, three, ah. or you can do six and three shared but parental this leave. This only makes sense if the father <laughs> is also a caregiver though. So, so, right? so you, know, you know how you said we can't talk about it today? It's deep. <laughs> it's deep. I mean... Because a few people I've talked to about paternity leave, yes, 
I mean, I remember one one guy actually saying to me, but what's the point? What am I going to do? Yeah. I'm yeah. not going to sit at home. I'm yeah. just going to go to the bar. Yeah. So why should I stay home? And I'm like, yeah. but you've been given yeah. that time to bond with your baby yeah. and help out at home. Look, let me try and keep this one really, really short. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I took that leave first, even mm. before the government had approved it to see if it would be possible. Because I, I, I believe that. I was like, what am I going to do? I mean, yes, I love children, and but I'm going to have my first child, and I'm going to take, what, two months off? For mm -hmm. what? To do what? To do what? To sit and look? To be told you're not holding the baby right? <laughs> so I, I, I get it. I get it. Mm. Um, but the one thing it taught me, and you know, this is backed by research, the first 1,000 days of a child's life, okay? first 1,000 days, you know, those who have calculators can calculate that, you'll end up at three. Yeah, the first three years. Are the most significant time for brain development, relationship building of a child's life. Now, we take it for granted, but remember that trauma I talked to you about? Mm -hmm. The reason we have the complexities later in teenagehood, you know, we complain, even the terrible twos we talk about, I, I don't believe there's any such thing as a terrible two, but all those things are impacted by the fact that these caregivers okay we, we call we say fathers aren't caregivers but they're they're there and mm -hmm. you know this little girl this little boy is looking up to this individual this man this mm -hmm. first male voice this first experience of of masculinity and wanting to build a relationship that will matter later in their lives and if that relationship isn't there in those first three years if it's not there in the first 10 years if it isn't a caregiving position do not be surprised if your boys and your girls turn out the way they are based on the way they were parenting. Mm. So I did it. Um, I'm still walking that journey, so the jury is still out. We'll yeah. see. <laughs> um, but the reason it's important, Crystal, the reason this is important, and again, remember I told you about the feminist approach to masculinity. Mm. The reason it's important is more women were saying they wanted to go back to work. More women could earn more than their partners. And this family could have the life they wanted to, build the house, buy the house, send their kids to the schools. So it, it was a, a logical decision. Yeah, for her to go back to work and for 100%. the father to be the caregiver. 100%. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, there was a conversation with the government and with services about making sure we built the right services to help these men. Because as you've said, society doesn't see men as caregivers. Mm -hmm. So if we don't see men as caregivers, how do we help them to become caregivers? I love Formula One, so I'll use the same scenario. Many people don't know there's something called the W Series. Mm. Because cars are built for men. You know this, right? Mm -hmm. They're all built for men. You sit in a car, my friend, that thing is shaped for me. <laughs> you have an accident in it, you're, you're finished. <laughs> so we now need to start building cars for women. For women. So in Formula One, the W Series is building cars that women can race in. So that eventually one day, and you know, I know people will be screaming, we can have women and men race. I did not know this though. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. In the same way, <laughs> uh -huh. we want to make sure society is ready when they see more men. And they're like, hey, my goodness, there's a man looking after child. It was, you look after your, your children. Exactly, because it should be a beautiful thing when you see a man with his kids and he's changing the, the diapers and he's giving them milk, but reading people are always a bit like, ah, yes. where's the mother? Yes, yes, reading to them. And you know, research has shown us that, you know, young women will build the type of relationship with the men they have based on the relationship with the father they oh, have. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, you the know, kind of partner you choose absolutely. is influenced by the father figure in your life. So let's be around, <laughs> you know, uncles, brothers, and let's be around. You know, if, if I grow up in a very seriously violent home, you mm. know, my father's violent, my brothers are violent, that's going to impact me. Yes. Okay? Um, I'm raising a girl and a boy, Tangaza and Chobe, and for me, for Tangaza, I really would like her to understand that the relationship I have with her mother is a positive one, the relationship she has with me is positive, that I can make her milk, as you say, change her diapers, walk her to school, read her a book. The more we read to our children, the more their minds open up to learn. And you know, we did a little experiment in the UK. We found that men on television were watched and listened to a lot more by children. Oh, you know okay. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they're never used to seeing them animated and excited and friendly. They're used to seeing them as police officers or very hardcore or disciplinarians. Which, by the way, I also don't have an issue with. But you can be a diversity of things. You can be a love, a carer, a supporter, a singer, a reader. 
So, you know, these kids saw these men being funny and they were like, this is hilarious. This is the funniest thing I've seen. You know? What? That explains a lot of the programming <laughs> on CBBS, if I remember. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. And, and same thing with the disability. You know, the more we put disability on television and, and let people experience it, the less frightened we are. Yeah. So, you know, on our, on, not, not on our, but on television in the United Kingdom, there are people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact that sometimes when people see people with disabilities, they go, oh, poor person, they can't do anything. Mm. Absolutely not. It's just pity. Or they get excited when that person can use another part of their body to write. Oh you my guys, God, it's amazing. See this. Let's film everybody, <laughs> tell everybody. This, this person, listen, I've adapted, okay? Mm. Um, that adaptation is also important with all these other aspects. So I've gone the extreme end, but the point I was making is, we don't see enough men, we need to. So we created services to ensure that it was normalized. Mm. And that's the journey. Okay, you need to change the perception. And that's really a society, everyone around us. I mean, even parents are like, ah, but that's not okay. <laughs> exactly. Simple things like, how can your husband make himself a plate? <laughs> I'm Hand, sorry, so small uh, things. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hand the baby to, her, to, mm -hmm. to your wife. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Make yourself a plate. I mean, again, like I said, we, we need another series for this one. For this, <laughs> for this very tricky I'll conversation. Be, I'll be back. <laughs> but now, you were telling me yes. your daughter was born at home and it was just you and your wife. That's right. My heart is beating. <laughs> That's okay, right. why that decision? Why that decision? Um, so... Okay, first time becoming a father. <laughs> yes. How was that for you? Okay, the first time I became a father was uh, very exciting, mm -hmm. um, but also nerve-wracking. Uh, mm -hmm. I wasn't ready. Chubb and I had been married uh, since we were, well, I was 25, she was 23. We were young, mm. uh, at least I think so, in the context of our relationships and friends. And uh, here I was having our first child at 31. And um, eight years later, right? And You still did not feel like I, you were ready? I didn't. I did not. I mean, I kept thinking, should you have children at 40? Uh, people had told me you should have them earlier on, but I was like, how? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how? Still need to put it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. My freedom. Yeah, no, we, no, but really, it was that freedom. Um, I remember saying to each other, I need to be around. I need to be a parent that's here. I had this whole idea that, you know, I would be retired at 35 and mm. be able to spend time with my children. Yeah, right. No, what you're saying <laughs> is a very real thing. I mean, studies have shown that women adapt to the change in your life when yes. you have a child much easier yes. than men. Yes. You know, it's kind of like, okay, the baby's coming whether I like oh, it or not. That's it. Absolutely. Men are like, how is this going to affect me and my friends absolutely. and my freedom and my ability to travel? And, and no one talks about that, right? So we went to, uh, we went to a class. Mm -hmm. uh, parenting class we learned a lot okay. despite the fact that I was this psychotherapist I still had to go to this <laughs> class and uh, I learned a lot okay. oh my goodness from the physical aspect of helping for birthing to calming yourselves uh, we liked that but Chirobo and I wanted a bit something a bit more natural so we went with something called hypnobirthing okay hypnobirthing and uh, hypnobirthing is essentially the natural way to have a baby as a man, I cannot speak about it. Okay. I cannot. But I can tell you about my experience of being with my partner and being my partner's birthing partner. Mm -hmm. um, my, my, my amazing best friend's birthing partner. And in that moment, she's not your wife. You are synced in what nature has brought together in the same way that we go and have sex. Mm -hmm. That thing is such a natural process. Nobody goes, let me first educate myself about this. Let me get a, you know, <laughs> let's get a lesson. Who does this? Duh. No. But we, you know, mm -hmm. this thing comes naturally also. Yes. And uh, we had a hypnobirthing person who supported us. So that prepared me for our first baby. She insisted that the environment needs to be as natural and as solid as possible. So we took some things from home, like the, the duvet cover, the pillow, a lampshade, some photos to mm -hmm. the hospital to try and make it exactly mm -hmm. and first baby has to be in the hospital in the uk so we had the first baby in the hospital so that was my experience of baby one and it, it is i can talk endlessly about chobe's birth uh but tangaza's really changed my life and the reason for that is uh, chobe said to me i don't want to have the baby in the hospital after all with hypnobirthing it's supposed to be as natural and in my own environment 
And how were you with that decision well, at first? Well, at, at first I freaked out. I went <laughs> straight to the medical side of things. I didn't tell my mother or her mother. Like, huh, so people are just going to think, <laughs> this, 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 this is why people have lost the plot. <laughs> you know? These foreign influenced children mm -hmm. have gone and done lost the plot. <laughs> okay? But um, we talked through it. Okay. And we went to more hypnobirthing sessions. We had the videos. Hypnobirthing is born in Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah? The baobab tree. You go and sit in there. This is what happens. You, you stay in there for days. The, the mother and her friends come and check on you and you have the baby. You know, like the antelope or the deer in the, in the forest. That, mm -hmm. That's all natural. Yes. That is hypno. So the conditions are created for you. That's hypnobirthing. Okay. So the relationship with your partner is important. The relationship with your child Very is important. Very important. Mm -hmm. Your friends. So we had to create this space. And Chirabo, who owned that, also had to create a space for herself to prepare for this baby. Now, we decided to have the baby at home. We prepared. The Nat National Health Service, you know, gives you a lot of things. Uh, a, a bathing pool. Uh, mm -hmm. Christopher T uh, Chobe was born in a bathing pool in hospital. Mm -hmm. So she wanted that. Okay. Um, so, so you we, set it up at home? Well, mm -hmm. uh, I'm coming to that bit. Setting it up was something. Um, <laughs> They gave us the thing and uh -huh. told us to pump it. Uh -huh. And um, you have to fill this thing with water. Uh -huh. Now, you're supposed to do this hmm, 20, 30 minutes before. And then you check the temperature to make the conditions all right. Crystal, uh -huh. uh, as a man who has experienced and seen the birthing process, that <laughs> does not work. <laughs> <laughs> but the 30 minutes, 20 minutes as later. You, as you put your finger in the pool, <laughs> wait for it to, mm -hmm, then walk around casually. Mm -hmm. As if my wife is just sitting there going, is so it you were just like, ah! is it Dude, no, absolutely. Adrenaline rush, you know? Mm -hmm. So a lot happened before, but to cut a long story short, we did have our baby at home. I didn't get that birthing pull up. I was actually out that night. Uh, we have an event we run, and I was at that event. So I was all dressed in my three-piece suit. Chirabo called me and said, baby's coming. You're supposed to call the midwife or the health visitor service to come home. Mm -hmm. They told this young woman, you can't be ready. You're talking. Can you imagine? Of course, in my head, all those kind of um, out of Africa tunes are playing. Oh, <laughs> these guys don't get it. The drums and everything. The baby is right? coming. These guys don't know what's happening here, boss. And she's saying the baby's she's coming. saying the baby's coming. Then she says the baby's crowning. Now, people have to Google that to understand it, but that means the baby is right there. Yes, you can and see it. She is exactly. You can see the baby's head, right? So we had to move to our living room and uh, it was, just, it was you... just me and her. Our son was at home, but we had read a lot of books about the babies coming at home. So this dear boy knew what to do exactly at that time. We'd set up a screen in his room. We, he doesn't have one, but we'd set up one and uh, headphones mm -hmm. and everything. Um, yeah, we went so to the So he was room. entertained. He was he content. He was out the way. He was content. Um, in, that, in that world, you have to find ways to inde be independent as a family. He went off to his room, we knew he was fine, and we had to focus on this. Fortunately, my brother turned up, Okay. went upstairs to him, and uh, yeah, my wife and I... So you delivered your second baby? So my wife delivered both our children, I helped. Because every time I no, say what to I mean, people, I like, deliver. Who received yes, the baby? That's, that's, that's what I mean, let, right? Let's really be okay, clear. Okay, you received. I'm sorry. <laughs> let's be very clear. You don't put that boss. This guy had the baby. <laughs> so okay. I received mm -hmm. the baby. You received the baby. Chirabo hypnobirthed, took a deep breath, did everything calmly. I'm in our living room. Um, I received that baby. Mm -hmm. And there was no emergency service until the point where the baby was in my arms, wrapped, and I had to figure out how I was going to cut that cord. Mm -hmm. At that point, I'm thinking, hmm, get pegs, scissors, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. Slippery, rubbery, this is going to be challenging. <laughs> By the way, the other thing is, and I know people know this, but baby never looks right. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> Um, the other thing I My mom always you, says when we're watching movies <laughs> and a baby is born, yeah. she's like, that is not a newborn. No, 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 and I'm like, mommy, who is going to give their newborn baby to a oh, film crew? Oh, exactly. <laughs> like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Form, form. <laughs> that head is, okay, now you can see the baby. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. No, but um, 
baby came, Tangaza came, she wasn't responsive. I had nothing to cut this cord. Chiyobo was saying to me, is everything okay? Are we, are we good? I'm saying to myself, God, you could not have put me through this whole experience. There's so much I've left out. You could not have put me through this experience to do this. I am literally in shock. My heart stopped. Um, I'm wondering what to do. I've, I've, everything's been done right. Chirabo keeps asking me, is everything okay? You know, have you, have you cleared, you know, we're now working. Have you cleared this? Have you done that? Have you? Mm -hmm. I have, I have, but it's okay. I think, I think no responsiveness from this baby. Nothing, oh my gosh. nothing. Mm -hmm. At that point, there's a knock on the door. Like God said, you know, let me send someone to your door. And it's the first emergency service. Okay. And he comes down on his knees. He sees me doing all this. Of course, they have to get into the whole thing. Puts an adult-sized uh, oxygen mask on the child's face. Nothing. So Still no response. imagine the time. This, this, this feels like it's now 15 minutes. Of course it isn't, right? And then fortunately, the midwives turn up with this little, little baby-sized oxygen thing. And she goes, oh, that's fine. And there's a cry. Yeah. I am just, I'm relieved. I'm like, my goodness. I am so relieved. I am, but I've got so much adrenaline. I know we need to get Chirabo up. All the other things after birth happens. We get her up, we put her in ambulance because baby's born at home and they're worried it might be shock. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, the reason there was no ambulance or any emergency service is because it snowed. Oh. So this is March 4th, 2018. It snowed heavily. So nobody could get through to us. So anyway, we get onto the road. I'm driving behind them. I'm nervous. I call my mom, my family. I said, the baby's been born, but there's a lot going on. I'll call you back. Okay. They come to a red light. I think something has happened. I couldn't see the, I, I forgot that there was a red light. So I'm like, oh my God, they've stopped, something has happened. I'm panicking throughout my drive. We get to the hospital. And the reason I, I need to tell you this story is you need to hear this. We get to the hospital, it's called Hinchingbrook Hospital. And we get to this point where the emergency people come because they've radio, radioed ahead, say, hey, yes. baby coming in, blah, mm -hmm, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Listen, there's 25 different professionals. I don't know, pediatrician who, the heart guy, the lying person, the what, they're all there. Chirobo is sitting in a wheelchair when they get her out holding our daughter, wrapped up. I've parked the car. I don't even know I've locked it. I kind of jumped out and run. <laughs> I'm standing with her. We see all these people, white coats, everything. It's the most amazing thing I have ever seen. People who have come to my rescue, our community. Mm. And we just cry. We start crying. We haven't cried since. Mm. We've been, we cried. You know why? We're just overwhelmed with the support that has come to us. And they go, no, don't worry. Nothing's wrong with baby. We're here for this. We're here for this. We're going to do this for you. This is this and this. Crystal, no baby was born in Hinchingbrook on 4th of March, 2018. Our daughter was born and brought into hospital. Mm -hmm. No baby was born that day in that hospital. It's as if the world stopped for so, my daughter to be born. So they were all available Everyone. at that point in Everyone time. Everyone was there. Oh, wow. Everyone was there. Can you believe it? I can't imagine the relief. Because you're freaking out. And of course, there's also that tiny bit of you that's like, okay, did we do something wrong? wrong. Is it our fault? What have we done? Did we, did I, did I, did some, did the baby's head hit the floor? Did, you're absolutely, you get it. Mm. You're absolutely right. Did I handle the baby right? Did I push something that I shouldn't have? That was very soft. Was that right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So the reason that part of this, the, the whole, that story is important is I have left child's eye gone back to have Tangaza born, mm -hmm. <laughs> I just said, listen, I need, a, I, need, I, need a, I need some time. I need time. I took nine months out of my life to be this consultant for fatherhood. I went on a journey for parenthood for men. And so this is when I started the work with His Royal Highness, Prince William. Mm -hmm. And we had this amazing campaign with future men yes. that really changed the perspective. I mean, for me, it was a rebirth. Tangaza's birthday reborn me. I was reborn that day. Okay. My understanding of the relationships I have with women, with people, the way I treat others, changed that day. Um, so I did that for nine months. It was an exciting piece of work. And then I realized, mm -mm, this is the same adrenaline from that time. <laughs> I need to go back to Uganda. And so I came back to Child's Eye Foundation. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Life changing. Life changing. Yeah. So um, you were telling me um, some of the work that you're doing right now is focusing on mental health. Yes. 
So can you tell yes. me about that? Because this is, I think, a yep. new campaign that yes. you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, you know, the first question you asked me about, uh, surely people have had a good experience and they've lived well and they've gone through orphanages. People have been educated. Absolutely. Uh, but a lot of what people didn't have is a sense of belonging, relationships to build on, that connection I talk about between parent and child, carer and child, mm -hmm. uncles, aunties, community. So we were listening to care leavers. Care leavers are young people or young adults who have left orphanages. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, in most scenarios, they're aged out. So you turn into, you turn a certain age, depending on the policy, 16, 17, 18, and you're told, it's, it's time, time for go? you to go. Make space for wow, the babies. Wow, wow. But you go out with very little of an understanding of the world. I've met young people who don't even know how to understand the different currency values. 5,000 shilling note, 10,000, 20,000, they don't know it. I've met people who don't know that you're supposed to pay rent because you've grown up in an orphanage. <laughs> oh my it's like, gosh. Hey, you, mean, you, mean, you mean I'm supposed, let me ask that guy or that lady who used to donate to do this for me. I've met people who don't know how to build relationships with people from their community because they only know them with the bonds of the white volunteers that came to Uganda to look after them. Mm. I have no issue with this coexisting of the world. I have a real issue with volunteerism. People coming into orphanages to volunteer okay. as a sense of their tourism. So this youth mental health project is about listening to the stories and the experiences of young people who have left orphanage care. Mm -hmm. Then it's supporting them to go through a healing journey to support other people experiencing trauma. Mm. Because when you start telling your story, you know, I grew up in this way and this is what I went through. Let's talk about you as a peer mentor. That is powerful. That is powerful. So it's called breaking the cycle. We want young people with lived experience of orphanage care or orphanage and institutionalization care to be able to retell their story and make it a positive story so that they can support other young people experiencing all sorts of adverse childhood experience, trauma, mental got Butabika and pockets of support yes. this project the youth well-being uh, project will support young people to become peer mentors of other young people okay. in their community so uh -huh. it's a community approach it's still based on that idea of doing ourselves out of a job building communities <laughs> that support each other yes there's a psychologist the youth well-being project the youth well-being project okay um, it's on our website childseyefoundation.org mm -hmm. sorry for that plug um, but it's, it's funded by Grand Challenges, which is a Canadian funder. Yes. Um, but we want to work with, we are working with Ministry of Health. We want to work with youth organizations because many youth organizations work with young people, mm -hmm. but not necessarily young people who have grown up in an orphanage. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, we're going to build this network of 117 young people mm -hmm. who will go out and reach 10 young people each meaning 1,170, mm -hmm. and change their lives, retell their stories, support their life and social skills. Okay. So we've worked with Macquarie University social workers and young people with lived experience. The create, care leavers. That's mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. a learning partnership. We've built this manual, which we've called Breaking the Cycle, and we've developed a series of four videos on topics that the young people told us about. And the two topics I'll talk to you about so that other people can go and look at them on the website, one of them is trauma, and the other one is suicidal ideation. So during COVID-19, mm. and even before, it's just that it's more, much clearer. It's more pronounced now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of sexual violence against women yes. and children. And girls. That's the trauma mm -hmm. aspect. Yes. And there was a lot of, I can't handle this life. Either I can't do it because I've missed out on school, or I can't do it because I have nothing to live for. I'm going to take my own life. Mm -hmm. Suicidal ideation. So those topics were so resounding so resounding they're one of the biggest topics mm. that we deliver so you can imagine a young person you know we've got these two amazing girls who grew up in ginger who when we met were on the verge and have just changed their stories imagine these young women talking about that experience changing that perspective the narrative saying you know this was the journey i was walking i had this support from a community-based angle i want to give you that same support mm -hmm. i'll leave you with this for most of the young people that we talked to at the beginning, 
their biggest issue wasn't even their relationships with their parents or any of that stuff. It was money. How am I going to have food to eat? So they were living in depression and experiencing a real weight of what they were going to do for the rest of their lives mm. after the pandemic. Yes. Even the fear of it. So the life skills to address that, to cope, the coping mechanisms, you know, giving them these five things you need to think about. For some people, the grief cycle, understanding that, that's, those are things we're training these young people to use. Mm -hmm. And then contextualizing it into our language here, our culture here, because we don't talk about these things. No, I mean, I like that you talked about the grief cycle because that also applies to so many adults who lost their jobs, lost their businesses, lost their homes. Your life is, you know, Absolutely. upside down and you don't know where to go. But as we wrap up, because I know we have to wrap up, I also know that one of the things that you dealt with early in your life was therapy. Yes. You went into therapy yes. early. Yes, I did. And uh, you're passionate about yes. fatherhood. Yes. And, a lot of men yeah. are not comfortable yeah. and how can we change that yeah. i think a lot of people are talking about yeah. male mental health for yes. that very reason yes absolutely and, and and male mental health impacts women's mental health and children and society you know mm -hmm. there's a an amazing legend a story that's told about where all the elephants die um i mean sorry all the 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 male elephants die and the female elephants are left and they start to die off soon after um, now, I went into therapy for a number of reasons, you know, I had experienced my own wanting to belong. I grew up in a polygamous family, but I loved my family and that was important to me. Um, but also, for me, it was the real understanding of who I was going to become. I really wanted to understand that. Uh, there's a poem by Marianne Williamson, quoted by Nelson Mandela, called Our Deepest Fear. Our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. You need to read that. That story, that poem has been my journey. Mm -hmm. And my therapy journey has really helped me to understand how to help others, but most importantly, how to be a better version of myself for mm -hmm. those around me. So I, I Our really- Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, but we are capable of something like way more than you can things. even imagine, it, right? It is not our darkness mm -hmm. that frightens us, but our light the fact that we can do much more. So who are we to ask ourselves why we cannot? You should ask yourself and you should say, I can. Believe that you can. And, and you know, in these times, that is such an important message. Yeah. So, you know, just to your point, I, I encourage men who haven't yet found that place to talk, to listen to themselves and to also reflect on yourself, your behavior. You know, it does a lot for you when you think, this is the journey I'm walking, but actually that's the journey I want to walk. Or mm. I could do better at this. How am I going to do better at that? Or I could have more money, so let me save. I could have more money, let me do an income thing. Or let me work with my partner to do that. It really changes that perspective. Okay. But remember what I said, mm -hmm. mental health and well-being is life and social skills. Yeah. When you get the life and social skills right, the budgeting, the relationship, the, the nutrition, the eating, the exercise, your well-being and your mental health will do a lot better. Okay. All right. Well, Chris, <laughs> I can't believe we're out of time. I know. But thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It was so nice to thank see you. Thank you so much. And yes, as I said before, you're doing important work. Thank you. It mm? means the world. You forget sometimes. I, I think. I do. Hmm? I do. I do. <laughs> I do. This one's for the social workers. Yes. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you.